providing the inspiration for our late film tonight. Parts one and two of fame, fashion and photography. The real blow up on BBC Two. In the 60s, fashion photography came of age. Photographers became as famous as pop stars and key players on the London scene. Italian director Michelangelo Antonioni based his film Blow Up in the heart of this world, and its central character was a hard-working, handsome, playboy photographer. Tonight, we take a look at the reality behind this picture of the swinging 60s and the characters who made it happen. They all had this knack of being able to work half the night and still find the time to have breakfast with a lady, if you know what I mean. <laughs> they were fashion notices. They used to tap me on the head and say, doesn't he speak to you? I thought, I'd give you a cue. What happened to me was a new thing. And I don't think one could have planned what happened to me. There was uh, an influx of I suppose money and talent in London that, that, that took off and it, and, it, and it really did take off. This film tells the story of a group of young photographers who fueled the craze for youth, pop and fashion and became as famous as the people they photographed. And none of them more so than David Bailey. In 1948 or 49, my mother took me to Selfridges. You know, it was like, that was part of your holidays, going to Selfridges. And uh, she tried on a Dior New Look coat. She couldn't afford it. And I remember her swirling around against the backlight. And I thought, my God, it's so beautiful. And it was sort of backlit. I didn't know what backlit was in those days. That was the first vision of a woman I really had. Born in the East End of London during the war, Bailey's initial interest in photography was fueled by his ambition to be an ornithologist, and he was soon taking pictures of birds and processing them himself. I tried to photograph with my mother's brownie because I didn't know about... I could never understand how you got close enough to the bird. <laughs> There's always a little spot in the middle of the negative because I used to process in my mum's cellar because I liked the chemicals and the, the magic, the alchemy of it. What I was doing was rubbing it up against the wall. <laughs> Bailey was hooked. A short distance away in Stepney, another East End boy, Terence Donovan, sadly no longer with us, had already started work as a photographer's assistant. He did have a camera at a relatively early age, so certainly by 1951 he is photographing, and in fact in um, 1953, for a picture he took in 1951, he wins uh, a medal at the Bethnal Green uh, Camera Club. So undoubtedly, this early success shows him that photography is something that he's good at, that he's been rewarded for. You see, what you've got to remember is that everything was against people like Bailey and I becoming photographers. He was designed to be a tailor's assistant, you know, and I was going to be loading sugar down Tate and Lyle. And it, there really wasn't people from where we came from being photographers, you know? But it was while doing their national service that both Bailey and Donovan grabbed the chance to pursue their passion for photography. When Bailey was conscripted into the Royal Air Force and posted to Singapore, he bought a cheap copy of a Rolleiflex camera. Everything was cheap there. I've still got my hock tickets somewhere, the Chinese hock tickets, because I used to hock my uh, cameras 
the Chinese hock shop to pay for the film. Then I, when I got paid my 24 shillings a week, whatever it was in the Air Force, I used to buy some more film and get my cameras out. And then the cameras every every month would go into hock to pay for the film. <laughs> When Bailey discovered the work of Henri Cartier-Bresson, his view of photography changed forever. It was a picture of four Indian ladies in their saris looking across the Himalayan Valley or whatever, and I thought, oh my God, it's, that's done with a camera. And that was the first time I realised that photography was a bit more than just a recording machine. Donovan's National Service was spent in less exotic climbs, with the Royal Ordnance Corps at Catterick. I was a photographer attached to a large ordnance depot, and um, I had to photograph you know, machinery, and uh, I had nobody to please, technically. I mean, none of the brigadiers or generals that I worked for knew what I was doing, so I had to generate my own discipline, and so I never let work go out that I didn't think it was excellent. The fact that nobody could judge whether it was excellent or not wasn't really of any consequence. When Bailey finished his national service, he'd made his mind up to pursue his passion for photography. His first paid job was a commission for a local wedding. It's the only two weddings I've ever done. They lived next door but one, and the daughters were called Margaret and Christine Fletcher. And Christine Fletcher got married, and she said, "I'll pay for all the film and the process, and if you do the, if you do the wedding." And my second wedding was Reggie Cray, but I couldn't really refuse that one. <laughs> when Donovan finished his national service, he got a job at the studios of fashion photographer John French, who had a reputation for producing top-quality, stylish fashion pictures for newspapers. John was photographing an era, and the era in th at that time was very static compared to what came after. It was an era where models posed, and if you moved, the photograph was ruined. John came into the dressing room and used to say, a little more blue eyeshadow, darling, or perhaps the lips a teeny weeny bit darker, or no, not as dark as that, just perhaps the top lip only. And the whole thing became a work of art, and it was the model herself and the photographer. No stylist, no makeup artist, no hairdresser, nothing. The model and the photographer, and that was it. <laughs> They were made to look very elegant with um, a little bit of help from a bulldog clip in the back of the waist to hold it in, or hat pins, great big sort of three inch hat pins was another favorite ploy that you tried not to jab into the model. Mr. French had favorite props, like say a sheaf of daffodils under the arm. And of course the little clutch purse. John's sort of photography was hugely formal and set up and organized and perfect, with terrific lighting and everything, and everything looked very white and sparkly. It was like sort of theater, and this flash would go off, and there'd be this girl sort of. His work was so um, black and white and clear that it worked very, very well in newspapers. He took a standard of photography that previously had been seen only in glossy magazines and introduced them into national newspapers, which was really quite something. John French was very important. He was like the sort of finishing school for photographers. I mean, it's all extraordinary when I think back. He was a very aristocratic figure, always immaculately dressed, um, very grand, but he took on all these young men as his assistants from the East End. Bailey now needed a job and set about getting one with a vengeance, writing to over 50 photographers, including John French and Tony Armstrong-Jones. He was particularly drawn to Armstrong-Jones, 
whose fashion work for Vogue and quirky reportage pictures appealed to the young EastEnder. I looked through all the magazines and decided that the two best photographers was John French and Tony Armstrong Jones at that period. Tony Armstrong Jones was the first as a photographer on Vogue to start really um, not taking, taking fashion so seriously. I mean, were, his photographs were zany, they were tongue-in-cheek, they were witty, and the, he refused to take it seriously. Uh, and in that sense, he had started to break down certain barriers just before Bailey and his generation came on the scene in the 60s. Those days of soda and pretzels and beer roll out those I didn't like photographing the clothes, and so what I tried to do was to have fun with them and make it more jokey and so let people go outside and jump around and get away from the studio. Sandwiches and weenies. It was very unserious. Now you're set. And on the beach you'll see the girls in their bikinis. As cute as ever, but... Bailey went for an interview with Tony Armstrong Jones at his Pimlico studio and was served tea on a silver service. And I think the whole atmosphere, he thought, I'm not sure I can cope with this, probably. Put off by Armstrong Jones' setup, his interview with John French went much better. When I went for the interview, he sort of talked about incandescent light and strobe, and I, and I said I knew it all. And later he said to me, I said, John, why did you employ me? You must have known I was lying. He said, yes, David, but I love the way you dress. <laughs> Bailey couldn't have got a more thorough training than working at Mr. French's busy photographic studio. Whether you're a mannequin wearing garments at a fashion show or a model being photographed in them, you've got to be a quick change expert. Marla has got it down to seconds. He was fantastic. He made you feel so good when you work with him. He always said, wonderful. He said, do this, and he gave you the pose, and you did it, and he said, lovely. And then he said, still? And his uh, assistant was then clicking the camera. And one of them was David Bailey. And he had those wonderful big eyes, watching everything, looking at everything, trying to learn about everything. John never, was like a director, he never touched a camera. I think he thought they were nasty little things. So you used to actually click it. And when he said still, that was your moment to click the camera. And, uh, you know, it was in the period when people used to say, catch a butterfly, which uh, was... <laughs> I remember once I buggered up all the uh, negatives. We used to stay and process it, and I pulled the dark room curtain across and hit the light switch. And I thought, shit, this is the end of my career with John French. At 9 o'clock next morning, I had to go and tell him, and he said, I thought I was going to get the elbow. And he just said, David, I'm shocked. I expect we have to do them again. <laughs> Despite this, French realised that Bailey was very talented and began to introduce him to his newspaper contacts around town. He took us both to lunch at the Ivy, and I think about the first thing I ever remember Bailey saying was John picking up the menu and saying, and what will you have, Bailey? Never called him David, always Bailey. What will you have, Bailey? Steak and perhaps a chop? And Bailey said, I don't eat flesh. John got him launched on his career, as he did with many others. Bailey left French in April 1960 and set up his own studio. With newspapers and magazines tapping into the new youth market, it was the perfect time to start out as a freelance fashion photographer. It was the first time that the young people wanted to be themselves, that they wanted to look the way they wanted to look. They wanted to make their own choices. They had their own money. They were able to go out and be more frequently employed in things that they enjoyed more and there was nothing representing it in the press. The nearest thing was the Express. We had a wonderful features editor called Harold Keeble, 
who used strong pictures, the fashion team tried to use young fashions. Knowing that Keeble was interested in new photographers, Bailey went to see him at the Daily Express. David Bailey had come in with his folio to show Harold Keeble, and Harold Keeble had lost it, and there was a bit of a crisis, because it was all Bailey's work, and he was only a little lad in a leather jacket. I said, I don't know who he is, but I mean, his portfolio has been lost, but let's go and have a look. So we went into Keeble's office, and I can't remember whether we found it in the dustbin or under the carpet. Anyway, the folio was found and Bailey was commissioned to do this picture, which was the lead picture for Autumn Girl. Bailey was booked for the shoot along with a model he'd met at John French's, Pauline Stone. He was John's assistant. Yes, there were a lot of sort of rather attractive assistants and he was one of them. The brief was to create an autumn fashion scene in a Clerkenwell studio. Well, the idea behind the picture was it was just September and it was autumn and we want to do something that brings it home to people that it is autumn. So we had a few dead old leaves dropping around, do you remember? <laughs> and a few little branches of this and the stuff squirrel. David definitely directed me. I don't think I'd have got down on my knees and put my bum in the air um, without him saying get down and you know play with the squirrel and you look as if you're kissing the squirrel I think I took direction from David when he took the squirrel picture he understood that we didn't want a stiff statuesque female looking absolutely superb but untouchable instead he realized he wanted we wanted a real girl that really epitomized you know the opening of autumn and the start of autumn and the lovely golden colors i knew when we were doing it it was a fun shot because we had the little squirrel and he just treated the whole thing completely differently from what i had been used to um, the stiff standing the hand on the hip and the leather gloves and the beautiful jewellery, none of that. It was completely casual and um, I felt it was different. It was used much bigger than they normally used fashion pictures. We usually dropped in very small, you know, like this. Oh, I see. And yes. they didn't do yeah. pages or things like that. I remember Donovan phoning me up and saying, what have you done? I thought, well, what's wrong? He said, uh, do you realize this picture's breakthrough? I mean, now you see it and you think it's a girl with a squirrel. It was just like no fashion picture had ever been taken like that before. It was just a great slap of excitement. It was tremendous. And certainly from that time on, I mean, when I showed the collections, I knew that I wanted the girls to move move like, like Bailey Cross to jump, to be alive. He wasn't the name, was he, in any no. way? But he was very talented. Mm. And he was a young, sort of beetly looking boy, wasn't mm. he? He was mm. very, very different mm. from all the other photographers who were rather stiff and elegant. Mm. And... But because of that, he, mm. he was very easy to talk to. Oh, yes. Because yeah. he was one of us, wasn't yes. he? Yes, <laughs> one of us. One of us. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't remember the picture of the squirrel with Pauline Stone. Must be quite a big squirrel. She's a big girl. Meanwhile, glossy magazines like Vogue were starting to look old-fashioned and were keen to sign up new young hot photographers. Brian Duffy, who no longer talks about his early career, was a graduate of St. Martin's School of Art and one of the first of the Young Turks to get a staff job at Vogue. Duffy's background was in fashion. He had studied fashion at St. Martin's Art School, and that was, his, uh, he, in a sense, um, his interest as much as photography, initially. He was mad, he was, Duffy was, but he was great fun also to work with. He only gave himself one year, to learn the technique of photography, 
And after a year, he went to Vogue and he became a Vogue photographer in a very short time, which was incredible. Duff is great to work with. You go in there and sort of three hours later, when you've finished all the bottles of wine that are lying around, you know, he makes you sing, you know. He won't take the shot, he gets bolshy. He's like, not taking the picture unless you sing. Go on, sing. So you have to sing, stand there singing in the studio. It's great. He just had a totally different way of, of approaching things and people. I remember once it, he got, I think it was Ronnie Scott and his and his side men up, up into the studios to, as a backdrop to, to the models. I mean, and they were playing like full blast. And he made them play, play, and the pitch got louder and louder. I remember it was quite extraordinary. So he certainly got the pictures he wanted. Now Vogue cast around for another of the new photographers, and Bailey was top of their list. They offered me a staff contract which meant you got paid by the week and I didn't you know come from the East End and being a bit of an Arab I didn't think that was a very good idea <laughs> so I said no it, in innocence really and of course why don't you say no to people they want you more Vogue's second approach was more enticing and Bailey agreed to join the magazine British fashion photography would never be the same again With Bailey and Duffy establishing themselves at Vogue, Donovan was also beginning to get his work noticed. When his first picture was published in Harper's Bazaar in December 1958, he decided to leave John French and set up a studio with his manager and future wife, Janet Campbell. I really believed in Terry's work. I believed that he could do it, and he, he did too. And so we worked very, very hard to make it happen. We found a studio in Yeoman's Row. We borrowed £5,000 from my father, and uh, we were in business. For a man whose name was to become synonymous with fashion, his first job as a freelance photographer was a rather unglamorous commission to take 15 shots of a sponge cake for 35 guineas. The models were lovely. A lot of models came and gave their time for nothing, no fee, so that he would get together a portfolio because he really didn't have anything. When he started on his own, we all tried to help him a bit. We went to his studio and we tried to be not too expensive. Leafing through his day books, you can see how much they packed into every single day and they worked furiously. He'd take you know, three or four assignments a day. And these are assignments that have to work, otherwise the client will not go back to this young photographer, Terry Donovan, who did it too, in too much of a rush. Uh, they have to be good. So I think his uh, concentration span and his um, work ethic is incredibly strong. His hard work was about to pay off, and Donovan was taken on by a men's magazine, Man About Town, which was keen to improve its image and had just been taken over by a young politician and aspiring publisher, Michael Heseltine. If you look at the magazine, you can see that sort of there were half pages of these guys standing like sort of dummies and looking extremely uncomfortable. Well, it was very stiff, you know. You'd be in a studio with a quite tricky lighting, standing there like a wooden window dummy, only a human, you know. And they'd take a couple of rolls of film and then goodbye, will you sign here? And that was it. Terence says himself, about men's fashion photography in that era that, you know, you were sent out to Regent's Park with a whole sort of basket full of, uh, of shooting sticks and bowler hats and you perched your model on the grass in Hyde Park or whatever. Our concept was of a luxury magazine, a lifestyle magazine as it would be today called, travel, good writing and topical comment, set in the most luxurious of context, wonderful visuals, higher standard of photography. He changed the name of the magazine to Town, brought in young photographers like Donovan, and turned it into the GQ of its day. Donovan made men's fashion and sexy. He actually depicted men holding women, quite chastely, but holding women. And he contextualised the thing. You actually saw men at a bar, men walking. Again, there's this whole thing of actually taking fashion out of the studio 
uh, and seeing it in the context of the way in which people actually live their lives. Using a compact and portable 35mm camera meant that Donovan was now mobile and could take pictures anywhere. Of course, once you're 35mm, you're flexible. It's, uh, you can go anywhere, anything, any light conditions. And that sort of vitality translates into the pictures and onto the page. What Donovan would do was make people look more human and make use more movement in more recognisable locations, you know, like his favourite area, the East End, where he came from, because he knew it very well. We would walk out of the door and if it was almost like, you know, point the compass because we're going that way. And it was always down to the East End. Shooting in the East End, he used to use little sort of working class streets of terrace houses and that sort of thing, and the like old fashioned thirties feel about them. Little old sweet shops and little old tobacconists and funeral parlours. We used to take pictures in things like gasworks and industrial settings, much more tougher, much grittier photographs. In fact, the word gritty that somebody once asked me about to describe the pictures became used for many years to describe that particular sort of style of photography. They were just simply tougher photographs, that was all. You do see it in a lot of the town pictures, this gritty, contrasty look, which was very new indeed. It wasn't being done. The only man that was doing it, there was a man doing it, Bill Brandt. And Bill Brandt, I would say, was one of Donovan's heroes. One of the unusual locations which we went to was Grove Power Station, where he put me up on a gantry somewhere in, in an Austin Reed suit, covered by smoke, as I remember. I mean, steam and smoke coming all over the place. Terry wanted to try out his new lens, which was about as long as your arm, you know. So the model had to stand the other side on a cooling tower there and uh, amongst all the girders, and Terry would take a bullhorn like old-time Hollywood director and tell him to move left, right, <laughs> whatever. It felt like I was half a mile away from lens, and how on earth it ever sold any Austin Reed suits, I don't know, but it was a terrific photograph. Suddenly there was this magazine that was, you know, allowing photographers, like Donovan going off to an ironwork somewhere in England and actually photographing guys wearing immaculate suits halfway up a gasometer or something. And that was considered, I mean, you know, really kind of bizarre. But actually, as a man, you didn't mind being seen sitting on the tube reading that because it was kind of tough and ballsy. A lot of Donovan's fashion shoots for town were like mini films. He predated the James Bond movies by about a year with his series of spy shoots. The scenarios were based on an agent who was gun carrying, who was moving around London from the airport to the hotel in and out of offices, in and out of taxis, shifty look, over the shoulder, but looking quite sharp in the pictures. Terry did submit one of my photographs to Cubby Broccoli and Harry Saltzman, who were the producers of the Bond films, and I was selected to have a screen test through Terry Donovan's James Bond-type photographs, which he was taking at the time. However, another male model got to play 007. While Donovan was setting new standards for men's fashion at town, Bailey was about to do the same for women at Vogue. But when he arrived, the magazine was still quite old-fashioned. Vogue was very social. It was fashion orientated, but it was extremely upper class social. When Bailey went into Vogue, 
He took a different ethos with him. He photographed real people in real situations and he took it down several social pegs. It wasn't the girls in pearls anymore. It was ordinary girls who happened to be exquisitely beautiful. Bailey absolutely shook up Vogue like it's never been shaken up before. I mean, all those dowdy old editresses were absolutely astonished when this whirlwind, mowgly figure came in with his wonderful, handsome face and his muscles and everything. He was, you know, he, 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 he did it, he had it. Bailey's rise at Vogue was rapid. Within eight months of joining, he'd published his first cover. But initially, he felt patronized by some of the staff. The fashion editors, they used to tap me on the head and say, doesn't he speak to you? I thought, I'd give you a cue. And uh, I got my own back, because within a year, the managing director used to ask me if I'd mind moving my Rolls Royce so he could get his food out. <laughs> so that was a sweet revenge. <laughs> we were all given a page rate. But you could up that anyway by coming up with ideas. I, mean, they were open, I know David was always doing that. And suddenly come, he'd find some girl, he can do an incredible, unusual portrait. Wet out of the dark room, running straight down there. And it, that's another, another page. Bailey was one of the first heterosexual photographers which made an enormous difference. I mean, he brought sex into the studio, which immediately changed the relationship between the model and the photographer. Who told you to move? Go back to where you were. Come on. That's where you were. Good. And that flipping hand. Yeah. Good. There. That's good. Now stay like that. Good. 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 There. Good. Give me a wide angle, don't quick. Hang about, this is marvellous. Bailey's brief at Vogue was to revitalise the Young Idea section of the magazine. The Young Idea was the kind of clothes that young people wanted to wear, whereas Vogue's young people before that wanted to wear versions of the clothes that the older people were wearing. It went through all the age spectrum, and Bailey broke that down. There really was a look that young people wore that was very different from Mummy. It was the teaming with Jean Shrimpton, fresh out of modeling school, that proved irresistible. Bailey met her on the roof at Vogue, working on a Kellogg's commercial with his friend, Brian Duffy. I was sitting in someone else's studio and this little head looked round the door and it looked quite grumpy, quite stern. It had that sort of beetle haircut long before the Beatles and these dark eyes and it just looked at me round the corner and disappeared and it was sort of... Mm. It was sort of instant, you know. I mean, I knew that she could be great. She, she was just a sort of country waif then, you know, and not much at all. I mean, she didn't know a thing, really. I remember David saying, I've got to find this wonderful girl. She got Jean Shrimp and she, and she appeared one day. We all said, David, you're completely mad. She's got no looks at all. And there was this sort of waif, not knowing how to stand. It was just David who saw this magic in her, and he very quickly brought it out. And he began to influence my movement and my dress. And then when he'd get me on the set, yeah, he'd put me into shape, you know. And he'd encourage certain expressions. And then I began to feel something inside which I didn't know existed. And it gradually sort of builds up. When he wanted to use Gene Shrimpton for one of the Young Idea stories, Vogue were initially resistant, but Bailey didn't give up. I had a big fight about Gene because they said, uh, we're not going to use Gene Shrimpton just because you're bonking her. And I said, well, that's not the point. I think she's the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. And uh, they said, well, if we give you the lead and we don't like it, we should do it with somebody else and you won't have it. So I sort of took the chance and it sort of worked. Vogue had the idea of teaming up models with famous faces of the day, including photographers. 
this was the break job. I mean, after this, Vogue loved me. They weren't really celebrities in those days, they were all intelligent. Huh. I mean, you can hardly call Ken Thailand a celebrity and George Melly. Bailey, what surprised me, took about 9,000 photographs. Click, click, click. It was like an insect, you know, all over the room. And he'd occasionally issue instructions, like he told Gene Shrimpton, it's very much amusing at the time, lose that arm sheaf. <laughs> Peter Cook. I wonder why Dudley wasn't there. An old Donovan. Oh, God, they used me in the background as a model. Would you believe that? Well, that makes it a better picture, doesn't it? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, this is Bailey. He had the extraordinary ability to, boom, get it. Just at that moment when he should have got it. Great, a great visual eye for that. It stands good, it looks good, and she's so splendid. Bailey and Jean started it. She was just so pretty, and her hair was tussled, and her legs were akimbo. Models didn't stand like that. You know, that wasn't what you did. But they did it, and, and the pictures were fabulous. She had none of that terrible self-possession of the earlier ones, you know, that handbag matching shoes look. No, she, she cleared the air in an extraordinary way, and a lot of us fell in love with her, yes. What they brought was an essential air of complete relaxation. They were natural poses and there was natural lighting and her face was launched a million faces. It had an ordinariness. Every girl aspired to look like Jean Shrimpton. She was a role model. Well, Jean Shrimpton was my idol. I had her all over my bedroom wall. I thought she was the most beautiful creature I'd ever seen. I think our success was mainly to do with timing um, because everyone had been very elegant and I was sort of a mongrel really by comparison and he was as well and I think he just portrayed me as a natural rather scruffy girl so I think really we just made it more human more accessible the shoot that really cemented the Bailey Shrimpton partnership was when the magazine decided to send the pair to New York for New York young idea goes west in January 1962 New York, New York! This is the first travelling trip. And Vogue weren't keen on 35 mil because they wanted everything on really 5.4. But uh, so I shot it on 35 mil and didn't tell them. And I put the negatives in an enlarger and blew the negs up so they never realised it was a small format camera. And my argument was it was a, not a loss of quality, a change of quality. I didn't know where I got it from, really. I just liked all the signs, and I didn't realize about Pop Art then, or Andy. You've got almost a proto-Pop Art photograph here, acknowledged, I mean, in a, in a way with great prescience in the layout of the magazine, which has an almost filmic, it, it's trying to be filmic and busy, and there's a page of kind of signs of non-fashion things, people playing pinball, there's a, even Coca-Cola bottle tops, and this is 1962 in vogue, you know. She had her teddy bear with her in every picture, and it was um, a really charming view of, um, of the excitement of moving out of your own environment into a totally different one. And the fact that they were so excited about it uh, re was reflected, I think, in the photographs. And you could sense that, that they were having a huge adventure. I remember Salvador Dali picked me up in the lift. 
I really didn't know who he was. It was very peculiar. And asked me to come and have tea up in his suite at the St Regis. I never went at that. I wish I'd have gone there. Anyway, it's another story. The Vogue piece is very much to do with, you know, taking the fashion out into the street and actually making it available for everybody. These were just pictures of actually, you know, how the clothes moved and how they look, looked on, 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 on women. Which is, I think, was suddenly you got away from the catalogue photography of being able to see detail and you were selling a mood. The pictures that they both did in Vogue um, was the beginning of, of, of it all, the beginning of the change, was the beginning of what, what one calls the 60s. When Bailey and Shrimpton returned to New York, they were welcomed with open arms by the doyen of fashion, Diana Vreeland, editor of American Vogue. We walked into her office and she says, stop, stop, the English have arrived. <laughs> Bailey and Shrimpton were now the golden couple of the fashion world, the posh and becks of their day. They were now not only working together, but living together. And up until 1964, Bailey photographed her almost exclusively. The camera was so in love with Jean, you almost couldn't take a bad picture of her. You know, she just had an unexplainable magic. And in all my life, she's never been a model that comes anywhere close to the way she understood something, the way her intelligence came through on the camera. Is that enough about Jim? I loved her. Look over to this direction. Keep your head up. Do you think you could shake your hair slightly? One characteristic the of the fashion okay. photography ah. seen in the early 60s is that there was a pattern of photographers working very closely with particular models. Okay. Let's twist it around. The close personal relationship it's led to a kind of in intensity, uh, which I think became very evident uh, in the photographs. There's a closeness, uh, it, there's a different mood from the, the traditions of earlier decades where there was always that distance. The day they left model school, these two plump unknowns got their pictures in the paper. Their names were Celia Hammond and Jean Shrimpton. Celia Hammond was an old friend of Jean's from modelling school. A school like Lucy Clayton, obviously, when they weed out the real shockers. In the same way that Shrimpton was Bailey's favourite model, I think Celia Hammond was Donovan's favourite model. And they both had this thing with these models. They could work well with them and they were partners, you know, in private. So they could bring, they understood each other and they could get wonderful pictures. And Celia was also very photogenic. There has to be a rapport between the photographer and the model, and it has to go through the camera. It was touchable, you could feel it. And um, yes, Celia, I would say Celia jumped through the lens more than most of them at the time. If you, if you don't find somebody who's really interested in you, you get your first pictures are inevitably appalling, and you lose confidence. I just walked into the studio and uh, he frightened me. I didn't realise it at the time, but he was just being, you know, jokey. But he did actually frighten me because he looked quite fierce. And um, I sat down, he was sort of barking orders at me. This is me, Celia. That was the very first photo I ever had taken by Terry. And I realised his bark was a lot worse than his bite. Don't move anything, keep still. Keep still, a slight smile. Really good models seem to make the kind of artificial thing of being on a piece of white paper justifiable. Most people, if photographed on a piece of white paper, look very embarrassed. They don't understand what they're actually doing there. And a really good model, when you're looking through the back of the camera, is completely involved with what you're doing. It's very strange, it's very magic. Celia was the model version of Julie Christie. I mean, basically, very sexy. I mean, I don't remember a single man of my generation in the 60s who wasn't wildly in love with Celia Hammond at one time or another. I mean, she just was, uh, she was the drop-dead bit of the equation. Although 
he was very earthy, he was also very strict. And you'd be told exactly how to move and what to do and where to put your hands and what, where, where to put your head. She knows we're going. Okay, it's would, right. would, I can't would, get my Let him come down for a second. Just twist it around. You know, when he was trying to get the pictures that he wanted, he was a naughty boy, really. Well, they, I mean, Bailey was the same. That's how they got their pictures, you know. But they were wonderful pictures, and I suppose that's all that matters, really. Duffy also had a favourite model, Pauline Stone, who'd previously worked with Bailey. Duffy uh, was seen around town with a very beautiful Pauline Stone, who was a redhead, amazing avalanche of red hair like Rita Hayworth. Whew, 